I hope you're all hungry because it's time to talk about typhoid. I'm interested in typhoid for what it teaches this class about critical medical anthropology. First, a little bit of the biology and ecology. Uh, how do you catch typhoid? Well, you catch it from a bacterium. Not viral, not parasitic. It's bacterial. That bacteria ha comes from a familiar family called Salmonella typhi. Have we heard this before? Yes, I just finished you tell uh, telling you guys about what an enormous family of viruses herpes is, for instance. Salmonella, same, same. There's different types. There's salmonella and then there's salmonella. I'm sure lots of you have said before, oh, I ate some bad egg salad or something. I think I have salmonella. And you might, you might have had one type of it. I suspect you probably didn't have typhoid though. Typhoid is another human only disease. There may be some animals that carry it, but they do so totally asymptomatically uh, and it's inactive in them. Typhoid really has to be caught by a human from a human. And happily, we now have a pretty effective vaccine. Uh, if anybody's done any travel to sort of exciting countries abroad, you may have been vaccinated against typhoid. It's not 100% uh, effective, but it's pretty good. So when you combine the vaccine with some, some standard safety hygiene measures, you're in good shape. I also want to be clear, this is not typhus, T-Y-P-H-U-S, different disease altogether, sometimes called, uh, it was named after typhoid because they resemble one another in some of their symptoms, but they are different things altogether. Okay, so you catch typhoid. What happens to you? Uh, you're going to pitch up a fever, general sort of immune response, so you'll probably feel achy, tired. You're going to develop abdominal pain. Typhoid particularly targets the gut. And then eventually a skin rash. What's unique with typhoid, I think so far, maybe in this course, this will be the only one that we discuss, the only disease that we discuss, that is transmitted. It's transmitted through what's known as the fecal oral route. Compound adjective, feces and mouth. So, remember, Callahan's rule of camping. What is it? Don't shit where you eat. If you do, right. Essentially, when it comes to typhoid, you're gonna get it by eating poop, mostly somebody else's. That somebody else has to be currently colonized by the bacterium Salmonella typhi, and if they are, you'll pick it up from them. Contaminated water supplies, certainly. Even, uh, there's some suggestion, unsafe um, or inadequately washed cutlery, plates, things like that. Fecal oral contamination. There are lots of other diseases that get passed this way. Polio, for instance, is one of them. And that's a virus, not a bacterium. But when we speak of HIV, things like that, of course, we're talking blood to blood or direct fluid contact. So the fecal oral route is a little bit unique. One of the other interesting things, biologically, about typhoid, and one of the ones that sort of sets the stage for our subsequent discussion here, is that there are asymptomatic carriers of typhoid. Meaning that a person can be infected with this disease, can carry the bacteria in their body without it making them sick. Some people, for whatever reason, are able to carry this bacteria around in their bodies without becoming symptomatic. They are asymptomatic carriers. The bacteria, however, still remains active in them, which means those people can be contagious, pass it on to others, they just don't get sick themselves. In terms of risk factors, this is why we're interested in this. Remember, we're critical medical anthropologists. Probably the number one risk factor for typhoid is poverty. Tell me how many dollars you make in a year, I'll tell you if you're at risk of typhoid. And that tells us something quite interesting. This is not a straight story of biology, is it? Put on your Paul Farmer hats, people. He would say, follow the money, right? Show me the inequality, I'll show you the disease. So, to that end, we want to talk about typhoid Mary. Mary Mallon, last name. Mary lived where? New York. New York City. That's right. So there is a real woman who lived in the USA, in New York City, whose name was Mary Mallon. She worked uh, service primarily. She worked for rich families as a cook, babysitter, worked in some restaurants and hospitals and things as a cook, kitchen staff, chambermaid in hotels, and stuff like that. And Mary 
ended up making a lot of people sick with typhoid. So, typhoid was a serious problem in New York at the turn of the century, around 1900. When people got sick with it, the public health, the doctor of public health would have to be notified. And they would put up signs, they would try to quarantine you, because they didn't want you making anybody else sick, right? The idea was that if we contain, then we can eliminate. When a whole handful of people in one family became sick with typhoid, the medical officer went looking for the cause, and sure enough, they discovered that Mary was the sort of common ingredient in a handful of families that had had uh, runs of typhoid through the family while she had been working for them. They sat down with Mary and asked her a bit about her cooking. Obviously, uncooked food is a particularly high risk, right? Boiled potatoes, the heat is going to inactivate that bacteria. Bacteria are pretty easy to deal with, right? Relative to viruses, very straightforward. They're big. They have little legs and eyes and stuff. They crawl around. Not quite, but they're easier to treat. Turns out that Mary Mallon's favorite dish was an uncooked one. She was famous for this peach dessert that she used to make, right? Peach cobbler or something. And that was the common ingredient. Every time Mary Mallon made peach dessert for her, whatever family she was working for, a handful of them would get very, very sick with typhoid. Some of them would in fact die, right? And so, she was taken off by the police. She was quarantined on an island off the coast of New York. And there she was kept performing stool samples daily for years for the chief medical officers of health. And I want to talk about why we think this happened there at that particular time to that particular person. Mary, it turns out, was what we call an asymptomatic carrier. She was positive for typhoid, but herself never showed a single symptom. Remember, 1901 is the days before antibiotics. She can't be cured. So what do we do with this woman who keeps making people sick? Probably would have been fine if she had just worked uh, as a lawyer or something. Didn't keep making uncooked fruit for people. But as it was, she made a lot of them very, very sick. If you're thinking Paul Farmer, then you're thinking disease follows fault lines, right? Social fault lines, class, gender. What about race? Hmm. Where was Mary Mallon from? One more time. Ireland. She was from Ireland. So she had blonde hair, blue eyes. She was white. What's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. A blonde haired Irish girl living in New York, she's got it easy. Turns out she does not. Got to dig deeper than skin deep. New York in 1900 is actually a place that is spectacularly racist against the Irish. This is an actual classified ad from the New York Times, America's newspaper of record, from the late 1800s. This was the kind of thing you would publish in job ads in newspapers in New York City, the largest city in America, at the turn of the century. Why did people hate the Irish so much? Let's talk about that. There were a few things. Number one, 1845, the Irish potato famine. Ireland is a country that relies heavily on potatoes, right? This is like a staple crop for a large number of the families there. A fungus goes through, or a fungus-like blight, goes through that country in the 1840s and 50s. It kills off huge amounts of the potato crop. At a time when something like six, seven million people lived in Ireland, one million people died and one million people immigrated, or emigrated. So a huge, huge number of people leave the island to come to North America, Canada and the States mostly, some to, to England. And the same old crap started that I'm sure many of us in this room are familiar with. I don't like these immigrants. They're taking away our jobs. They're not as clean as we are or as tidy. They eat all this weird smelly food. They practice a weird religion. What religion are the Irish? They are Catholic. What religion are the English? They are Anglican Church of England Protestant, yes. And those two, I mean, this sounds like a super trivial difference to us, but back in the day, the difference between Protestant and Catholic, huge. So, so, even though we think of Mary Mallon as being actually this sort of amber-haired woman with blue eyes and stuff, racism plays a part in this story, right? Racism is just not only about Martin Luther King. It's not just about Islamophobia. There's always a history. There's always a politics. 
Mary Mallon had three things going against her. The first was only that she was an asymptomatic carrier. The second was that she was Irish. What's the third? She was a woman. Yeah, is 1900 in New York City a great time to be a woman? Nope. Why didn't Mary just get a job as an accountant or something? She didn't have to be a cook her whole life. Yeah, she sort of did. That was about what was available for an Irish woman at that time. Go to college? Not quite. Get a nice office job? Forget it. So I see Mary as being this perfect scapegoat. As it turns out, subsequent research has identified dozens of other asymptomatic carriers in New York City at exactly the same time. One of them was Irish and one of them was a woman. And it became way too convenient to pin the thing on her. So, typhoid teaches us an important lesson about critical medical anthropology and that lesson is that diseases have social lives. Pathogens go out there in the public. They interact with our attitudes about gender, about race, about religion. They interact. Who gets blamed? Who gets treated? How do they get received when they need care? Who gets stigmatized? Right. I think that is why Mary Mallon is most interesting to us. That's the lesson that I think I wanted to teach us about typhoid. There's a real comparison to be made here with HIV. Remember the 4-H club in the early days? Aside from hemophiliacs, we had Haitians, heroin users, homosexuals. The one thing those three groups have in common is that they're socially marginalized. That it was okay in the 1980s to hate all three of those groups. And in 1901 it was okay to hate the Irish. <laughs>